Tonight, can the Liberals regroup? I am absolutely 100% behind the Prime Minister. On the eve of key testimony, Justin Trudeau looks for a way out of the SNC mess. What Canadians are saying about the damage done? The treatment has been discontinued now for around for 18 months. For just the second time ever, an HIV positive patient is cleared of the virus. But why are doctors using the word cured? You can feel the tension when you're walking around. You're, you're, you know, you're picking your words. And trying to solve an environmental disaster tears a Nova Scotia community apart. Why the government and First Nations say enough is enough. This is The Nash. Here in Ottawa tonight, there is an air of anticipation. Just hours from now, a parliamentary committee will hear a critical chapter in the SNC-Lavalin story. What is said and how it is received could change the way Canadians perceive the Liberal government for better or worse. Gerald Butts, Justin Trudeau's former principal secretary, will get to do what he quit to do, give his version of the events already described in testimony by former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould. She said she resigned after sustained political interference in her job and that Butts was part of that. Tomorrow he will rebut her, but will he refute her? In a moment, we'll look at what you can expect. But first, David Cochran got some insight on how the Liberal strategy is taking shape, on the eve of crucial testimony. A hasty return to Ottawa for some high-level talks. Justin Trudeau scrapped a trip to Regina to huddle with top advisors and plan his next moves. So an afternoon strategy session in the midst of a political crisis. The Prime Minister, Chief of Staff Katie Telford, Communications Director Kate Purchase, Issues Management Director Brian Clow. Also present, David McNaughton. Canada's ambassador to the United States and one of Trudeau's most trusted political advisors. At issue, according to a source, the possibility of a message of contrition, a way for Trudeau to show some ownership over the actions of his staff and officials for their dealings with former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould. It's a shift from the tone of defiance the Prime Minister adopted on day one. The allegations in the Globe story this morning are false. But things have changed in sudden and seismic ways. The abrupt resignation of Jane Philpott, one of Trudeau's most respected ministers, has forced a shift in thinking. I want to address something. And a shift in message, the first signs of which appeared at Monday night's rally in Toronto. This matter has generated an important discussion. How democratic institutions, specifically the federal ministry, and the staff and officials that support it, conduct themselves is critical and core to all of our principles. So while those deliberations happen in private, others go public with their support for the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister absolutely has my confidence. I have absolute confidence in the Prime Minister. I believe that the government did nothing wrong. Maybe not, but contrition is on the table. Hi, Prime Minister, are you going to apologize? Pleasure to see you tonight. Apologies, sir. So should we expect this message of contrition from the Prime Minister tomorrow, David? Yeah, that's still not clear, Rosie. We know that the, him and his top advisors met for several hours, but still no final decision has been made, and largely because they're waiting on a couple of things, namely the fact that it's a big day at the House of Commons Justice Committee tomorrow. Jerry Butts, the Prime Minister's former top advisor, is going to testify in the morning. That's the main event. He has a very specific narrative to tell to the committee. The Clerk of the Privy Council, Michael Wernick, is back for a second appearance, as is the Deputy Minister of Justice, Natalie Drouin, who's back for a second time. So what I'm told tonight by senior government officials is that the Prime Minister and his advisors want to listen to that testimony, see how it plays out, see what the reaction is, and then decide when and how the Prime Minister is going to respond. I'm told it's possible Trudeau could respond as soon as tomorrow afternoon. A senior official says tonight not to rule that out, him responding after the clerk's testimony is done, perhaps. And, Rosie, if that happens, a big day on this story is going to get a whole lot bigger. Okay, I'll meet you back here tomorrow, then. David Cochran, thank <laughs> <Thanks>. you. <laughs>
The SNC Lavalin story has dominated headlines for a month. Now there are signs it is having an impact on voters as a fall election gets closer. The CBC's latest poll tracker shows the Conservatives edging ahead of the Liberals. And the creator of that poll tracker, Eric Grenier, joins me now from Ottawa. Okay, what should we make of these still early polling numbers, Eric? Yeah, they are very early. They're all data that comes from before uh, Jane Philpott's resignation this week. But we have seen that the Liberals have taken a hit about four points in the polls since the story first broke at the beginning of February. And this is the widest lead we've seen for the Conservatives in the polls in almost a year. Uh, we've seen losses for the Liberals in Ontario and Atlantic Canada and also in Quebec, though they are less vulnerable there where the snc Lavalin affair is playing out much differently. Okay, what are the prospects then that they can recover? Well, the last time they were this low was in the wake of the India trip uh, last year. And we did see that after six months, the Liberals were able to regain a six-point lead over the Conservatives. So the question is whether the Conservatives will be able to make this last and hold the, the voters that they've been able to get over the last few weeks. But Andrew Scheer has not shown any growth in his own personal numbers. He's still trailing the Prime Minister on a number of factors. And in some polls, his numbers actually have gotten worse over the last few weeks. So that's the challenge for the Conservative leader. And last year, as I think this year, they used the budget to sort of reset the narrative. We'll expect them to do that again. But how has Justin Trudeau's personal brand taken a hit in this particular controversy? He took a hit after India, but I think that he took a hit that goes to trust and ethics. We've seen a number of polls now that show by a margin of two to one, Canadians believe Jody Wilson-Raybould's version of events over Justin Trudeau. And we've seen that there's a significant portion of voters who used to have a good opinion of Justin Trudeau, thought that he represented positive change. Those voters are now questioning that. And the challenge will be whether the Liberals will be able to prevent them from going over to the Conservatives or staying home. Okay, CBC poll analyst Eric Grenier, thank you. Gerald Butts has been Trudeau's top advisor, chief confidant, and even longtime friend. Now he'll give his version of the controversy dogging the government. Salima Shivji examines three key points you should look for tomorrow. The stage set, the expectations high. We are only beginning to hear um, the facts. I think people are looking forward to hearing uh, what Mr. Butts has to say. And what his testimony might refer to. Gerald Butts will come armed. It's a promise he made when he asked to testify, wanting time to be able to produce relevant documents to the committee. I will now read to you a transcript of the most relevant sections of a text conversation. But Jody Wilson-Raybould did it, and so will he. Text messages he believes will counter the former Attorney General's story. Butts was her main contact at the Prime Minister's office, and they texted a lot. Watch for Justin Trudeau's former top advisor to get specific on key dates. On December the 5th of 2018, I met with Jerry Butts. That meeting at the Chateau Laurier Hotel, just a block from Parliament Hill. In Wilson Raybould's version of events, she was being hounded in what she says amounted to veiled threats. Jerry then took over the conversation and said how we need a solution on the SNC stuff. He said I needed to find a solution. Her picture of relentless pressure included another meeting on December 18th. This time, Wilson Raybould wasn't there, but her chief of staff was. Jerry said, quote, Jess, there is no solution here that does not involve some interference, end quote. The opposition wants more than simply she said, he said. I think Canadians want the whole story. They want to know everything from top to tail, exactly what happened, how it happened, why we ended up with having three major resignations in the span of four weeks. But tomorrow may come down to this, the tone. Some Liberal MPs have told CBC they're worried about which Jerry Butts will show up. The enthusiastic debater has a reputation of going to battle on social media, vocal, aggressive, partisan. The leader of it has done a phenomenal job, and that's Justin Trudeau. Tomorrow, he will need to tread a fine line, presenting his version with force without attacking or appearing to attack the woman on the other side. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, so the testimony starts tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern. You can watch it all on CBC News Network and online. And, of course, you better believe we'll have a special at issue tomorrow night to break it all down.
And for the Liberals, it increasingly looks like trouble at home, trouble abroad, as they also react to a possible escalation in the conflict with Beijing. China is the world's top canola importer. Canada, one of its top suppliers with billions of dollars in annual sales. But Beijing has now blocked one of Canada's biggest canola producers from its markets. The affected Canadian company is an industry giant that needs that China business. And as Katie Simpson explains, it has doubts about China's explanation. It starts here with one tiny seed. Richardson International is one of Canada's largest and most well-known canola exporters. For more than 150 years, the Winnipeg-based company has shipped its goods around the world. So as China suddenly cites quality concerns for why it will no longer accept Richardson canola, company officials don't buy it. Richardson has been directly targeted, a senior vice president said in a statement. We think this is part of a larger Canada-China issue, and we hope it gets resolved expeditiously. We do not believe there is any scientific basis uh, for this. The foreign affairs minister all but directly linked this new canola issue to the ongoing diplomatic dispute. We are working very, very hard with the Chinese government on this issue. This is an utmost priority of our government. Beijing is furious with Ottawa over the arrest of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou, demanding her release. China has retaliated by detaining two Canadians, alleging they work together to steal state secrets. And what we're really concerned about is how do we get um, back on track with China? Canola farmers have long feared they could be caught up in this spat. 40% of all Canadian canola is exported to China, which is about $2.5 billion in sales a year. It's a big problem because it is such a big market and uh, it is one that we rely heavily on. Canada has been anticipating more Chinese retaliation, especially after the government refused to kill the extradition case against the Huawei CFO when it had the chance to do so last week. This appears to be China's next escalation. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. All right, now to a series of mysterious, mysterious events out of London, England. That's right, Rosemary. Letter bombs were sent to ch several travel hubs. First, one suspicious package ignited at Heathrow Airport. Then two more similar padded envelopes arrived, one at a busy train station, the other at a second London airport. Security services across the country are already on their second highest alert level for public attacks. And as the CBC's Thomas Dagla tells us, British counterterrorism police are now investigating. London Waterloo, Britain's busiest train station and one of three targets in a string of parcel bomb attacks today. You think about it, you think, wow, this place is jam-packed full of people and what would happen if something did happen? You will need to travel. As commuters headed home this evening, many only just got the news. Pretty scary, actually, yeah. yeah. I've just come from City Airport as well, so I had no idea about that. Police say the three explosive devices, including the one found here in the mailroom at Waterloo Station, were only big enough to light a small fire. But considering the targets, three busy transport hubs, whoever did this was bound to cause a big commotion. The first sign of trouble came near Heathrow Airport, where this morning this package was opened, setting off the small explosive inside. Later, police put up a cordon outside Waterloo Station and within minutes were called to London City Airport as well. At those two locations, the envelopes were unopened and could unlock crucial clues. Just check out the postage. Those are wedding-themed stamps from the Irish Postal Service. And notice the handwritten return address in Dublin. Police sought to reassure the public, saying they're treating the incidents as a linked series and keeping an open mind regarding motives. Of course, it could be someone that's gone from England over to, to Dublin to post them. We don't know whether this is the first in a series of these or whether, in fact, there are others sitting on people's desks. The devices didn't cause injury, only concern. But it is worrying, having said that London is one of the biggest cities. It's a great city to live in, but you're going to get these sort of situations. An unsettling reminder of terror in a city that has seen more than its share. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. And Andrew, you're looking into an almost unprecedented 
medical case. Yeah, Ian, researchers have stopped short of calling it a cure, but an HIV-positive man who received a bone marrow transplant now appears to be HIV-free. He's known as the London patient, just the second person in known history worldwide to go into a mysterious remission following cancer treatment. And as Cass Rusi tells us, that has scientists intrigued and excited. My case, my history is proof and concept that HIV can be cured. Hope is alive and cure is on the horizon. Timothy Ray Brown, known as the Berlin patient, was a medical first, the first HIV positive man to be cleared of the virus after receiving an experimental bone marrow transplant back in 2007. A transplant that was meant to save his life from leukemia and not rid him of HIV. We now know it wasn't a fluke. It's happened again. And one of the researchers involved in this medical second says he's over the moon. The treatment has been discontinued now for around for 18 months and there's still no virus in his body. So that's why it's called remission. Uh, we don't want to call it cure and it's not a cure yet. The unidentified man known as the London patient contracted HIV in 2003 and later, like the first patient, was diagnosed with a blood cancer. He received a bone marrow transplant and again, like the first case, it came from a donor with a rare genetic mutation that was resistant to HIV. The way these two men were cured is by eliminating their own immune systems and replacing it uh, with an immune system that was resistant to HIV. Clearly this provides hope, I think, to the entire HIV community. So the you know, community of HIV researchers, the community of people living with HIV, the community of people at risk for HIV. But researchers caution bone marrow transplants won't become the go-to treatment for HIV. We're not going to be doing stem cell transplants as a way to cure HIV more widely. That's just neither sustainable nor safe. They say the focus going forward should be on gene editing. They also point out current HIV treatment allows patients to live long and healthy lives. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. And, and that is most certainly true. HIV therapies have come a long way, but the prospect of a cure still matters because those drugs don't kill the virus. They only suppress it. Years of prevention, education, and treatment come with an asterisk. Transmission rates peaked in 1996 and have been dropping ever since, but there are still around 1.8 million new HIV infections annually. And while AIDS-related deaths have been dropping since 2005, it still kills about a million people every year. The big change is how many live with the disease, more than ever before, thanks to a massive effort to get antiretroviral drugs to regions like sub-Saharan Africa. In 2007, 12% of the world's HIV-positive population got those drugs. Over a decade, that climbed to nearly 60%. The number of people treated now, more than 21 million. But while almost every region has seen infection rates drop in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, since 2010, infection rates have surged 29%. HIV is elusive, a virus and epidemic evolving. And right now, its chief ally may be complacency. Here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight. Singer R. Kelly has given his first interview since being charged with sexual abuse. Quit playing. Robert. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. I'm fighting for my life. The charges against the singer involve four women, three of them underage at the time of the alleged events. Kelly has pleaded not guilty to 10 charges. This interview comes after the documentary Surviving R. Kelly featured interviews with some of his alleged victims. Hello, Wade. There's also more fallout from HBO's Michael Jackson documentary. Two men allege they were sexually abused by the singer when they were children. Now the Quebec broadcaster, Kojiko, has pulled Jackson's songs from three of its stations. Other broadcasters, including CBC, say they're reviewing their position on playing his music. And ahead tonight, the small town in Nova Scotia that's trying to find a way to clean up a polluted mess without destroying the source of its jobs. And an Air Canada pilot takes matters into his own hands and orders takeout for passengers. That should be a regular thing. First, though, the Canadian business school dropout who thinks he can save HMV. We've got 1,600 people that work for us that rely on us to get that paycheck every week. And 
we can't fail, we have to deliver. So in the 80s, I'm dancing now, video killed the radio star, and 30 years later, the internet massacred the record store. Look at HMV, it dominated shopping malls everywhere, then it went into receivership in 2017. But thanks to a Canadian entrepreneur, that's not the end of the story. Doug Putman uh, bought the brand in the UK and thinks that bricks and mortar is still a solid investment. He's betting that his millions can save a bankrupt chain of 100 record stores in a foreign country. Diane Buckner looks at Putman's effort to help revive a dying industry. It's been here since 1921, the original HMV store in London's Oxford Circus. Record stores have had their day, unfortunately. When I was younger, I used to come in here every week. I used to love it. HMV declared bankruptcy in the UK last December. Who would have thought that the record store where the Beatles recorded their demo would go out of business? Now the chain may have new life, thanks to a Canadian that British papers are calling a saviour who will rescue the company. But don't tell him that. Honestly, I find it flattering. I'm starting to blush right now. In Hamilton, Ontario, this is the so-called saviour, Doug Putman, a 34-year-old business school dropout. You know, I just keep saying I feel lucky that we were able to do it. Our customer really likes to actually leaf through it. We're in one of the 85 stores Putman owns in Canada, the Sunrise Records chain. It was HMV Canada until 2017, when that part of the chain went bankrupt. Putman bought it, rebranded every location as Sunrise, and started turning a profit. We know we did it in Canada. We know we're going to do it in the UK. So this is just our toy distribution warehouse. He'll need all his business know-how, which he developed here at his family's toy distribution company. My parents started it uh, 25 years ago, so uh, my dad was a steel worker at Stalco for many years and uh, remortgaged his house with my mom and took $50,000 and said, let's try it. He started running the company at age 23 and expanded the operation. The music business, though, presents a special type of challenge. You can pay Spotify or Apple Music a very small amount per month, $10, $12. And theoretically, I'll say theoretically because there's a few exceptions, but theoretically you've got all the music in the world available to you. Despite that, this industry observer thinks with the right product mix, Putman has a shot at success. He's clearly got a good formula, and I might go 50-50, maybe even 60-40 in his favor. I hope it works. How's it going? In London, at HMV head office, Putman is starting to work with product managers. I mean, it doesn't seem like we get much supplier support. There's not a level playing field at the moment. The challenges are the digital window, which has been there a while now. A hundred stores in the UK will keep the HMV name, but switch to his Sunrise formula. More music-related merchandise, vinyl showcased at the front of the store, wider selection. We've got 1,600 people that work for us that rely on us to get that paycheck every week, and we can't fail, we have to deliver. He has a lot of work to do to earn his savior status. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. Ahead tonight, the new bobsled team from the tropics hoping to make history at the next Winter Olympics. First, though, though, a small town in Nova Scotia deeply divided over the local pulp mill, the jobs it brings, and its impact on the environment. You can feel the tension when you're walking around. You're, you're, you know, you're picking your words. And I, I'm nervous that uh, there's going to be something happen, like somebody's going to get killed or something over foolishness. Here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight. A Quebec mother has been found guilty of second-degree murder in the deaths of her two young daughters. The jury heard that the daughters of Adele Sorella were found dead in the playroom of the family home. There were no signs of violence, and the cause of death was never established. This was the second trial on the charges for the 53-year-old. Her 2013 conviction on first-degree murder was overturned. Google is banning political advertising on all its platforms ahead of the federal election in October. This follows new transparency rules that require companies to track political and partisan ads, something the tech giant says is a challenge. 
In order to comply with the legislation, it just isn't accepting any political ads at all. And Hillary Clinton is confirming that she will not run for presidential office in 2020. She lost her bid in 2016, of course, to Donald Trump. And former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg says he won't be running either. This sends months of speculation that he might have. There's a big problem in Pictou County, Nova Scotia, putting jobs at risk across the province. The northern pulp mill is a crucial part of the economy, but every day it pumps 75 million liters of effluent waste into Boat Harbor. Now that's a body of water lying next to First Nation land. The province said that had to stop, and it gave the company five years to implement a solution or face a shutdown. Well, that deadline is less than a year away, and the company says it can't be met. Even worse, the plan it's working on is raising a whole other kind of alarm. So here's the lay of the land in Pictou County. As it stands, the waste from that mill is piped underwater to Boat Harbor, where it's treated before flowing into the Northumberland Strait. The company's proposal is to treat the effluent on site at the mill and pump it directly into the strait, but further out than where it now flows. And that's a concern for those who depend on the coastal fishery for their livelihoods. What it all adds up to is a complete and utter mess with no easy answer and a community full of people with a huge stake in getting it right. The CBC's Tom Murphy is there. It's an unmistakable Pictou County landmark, the Northern Pulp Mill. And not far away, Nova Scotia's dirty little secret. This is Boat Harbor. For decades, governments dithered while toxins flowed from the mill into this once pristine body of water. Still do. Now, finally doing something about this province's worst environmental scar is dividing the community. Pictou County, like a lot of rural places, has had a hard scrabble life. But for 52 years, it's had the mill, dominating its skyline, paying hundreds of good salaries, sustaining families here for generations. Yet, truthfully, it's always been a love-hate relationship. And these days, there's a growing crisis of conscience here. People know they have to break up with Boat Harbor, find another way, end the unthinkable pollution they have caused, once and for all. But the stakes are high, very high. Not everyone is willing to bite the hand that has fed them for so long. I worked at that pulp mill for 25 years. I don't want to see it closed, mm -hmm. but I don't want to see anything harmed out there either. I know fishermen, I know people that work at the mill, but it's the environment that I'm worried about. There must be another solution there somewhere. The solution, according to the mill owners, is a pipe to carry treated effluent from the mill's property directly to the Northumberland Strait, away from Boat Harbor to the water beyond. No pipe, no way. And that has sparked outrage. Some here fear that allowing the new pipe is akin to making another deal with the devil. That's because Picto is also a fishing community. We do not want this pipe in our waters. Last summer, fishermen took to the strait in the largest protest ever seen in these parts. Ben Anderson, a fifth generation lobster fisherman, was part of that protest. He fears for his livelihood, the same way the mill workers fear for theirs. How much of your life do you have riding on the health of the Northumberland Strait? Everything, pretty well. House, the gear, boats, Everything day in and day out income. I live basically off what I make per trap. If I catch no lobsters, I make no money. And it goes for pretty well everybody else that's in the same ballpark. There'd be a lot of angry people. A lot of angry people. But fishermen here have a fierce ally, the Mi'kmaq First Nations. And the children that spoke today, we do this for you. 
We're going to stay For Picto here. Landing First Nations Chief Andrea Can Paul, Boat Harbor is personal. Whatever the solution for the effluent, closing Boat Harbor is about righting a historical wrong against her people. I definitely think it was environmental racism and they had no regard for the people that lived around the area. It wasn't doing anything, just existing. No one is using it, they said. Let's dump the effluent there. In the 60s, the province used the Indian Act to take, some say swindle, the land from the Mi'kmaq. The deal was the mill owners would only build in Pictou County if they had a place to dump their effluent. The government of the day, desperate for jobs, assumed all responsibility for the environmental damage and let the company pollute Boat Harbor. This is the outlet from Boat Harbor. And this is what's going into the sea. Picto Landing First Nation was promised there would be no impact. But days after the affluent entered Boat Harbor, all the fish were dead. You hear the stories of the people going down to gather their fish and the fish are all, they're all up in the surface and they're just, they're, they're gulping and they're, they're, and you can, and they talk about, they can just go in and scoop them up. How painful that must have been. Incredibly for years, governments of all political stripes defended the darkened water and the dirty foam. We have in Nova Scotia uh, brownish waters naturally. It's called good Nova Scotia bog water. Now, shamed by it all, Nova Scotia Premier Stephen McNeil vows to do what other political leaders promised and failed to deliver on, close Boat Harbor for good. Well, quite frankly, it's unacceptable uh, that in the 1960s that uh, Boat Harbor was put there because it's next to an Aboriginal community. Uh, this may have been acceptable to create, a, uh, uh, to create Boat Harbor in the 60s. It's not okay today. Well, we felt we gave them five years, uh, and I've been very clear about that, uh, that on January 31st, 2020 is our deadline. That's less than a year away, and the mill is still a long way from having an acceptable solution for its effluent. The reality is stark. Either the government will have to break its promise to Picto Landing First Nation, or the mill will be forced to shut down, at least until a viable solution is found. And as that reality sinks in, tension rises. Everyone has an opinion on which is the lesser evil, and they're tiptoeing around their neighbors. Just ask Jack Fraser, a former mill worker. You can feel the tension when you're walking around. You're, you're, you know, you're picking your words. And I, I'm nervous that uh, there's going to be something happen, like somebody's going to get killed or something over foolishness. And here's why the mill is so important to so many. Each year, 42,000 truckloads of wood chips, bark and round wood is sold to this pulp mill from sawmills and woodlots all over. If Northern Pulp closes, the fear is the forest industry would falter. You know, people are saying, oh, it's only the 300 jobs at the mill. No, it's not. It's, it's 11,000, 12,000 plus jobs. You know, the people that sell tires, sell gasoline, you know, sell building supplies. Like, it's, it's widespread, boy. What do you see when you look at this? What do you see? Yeah, I see the effluent from the mill being treated to the point where it passes all effluent regulations. But Walking around Boat Harbor, Northern Pulp's Mike Wilson points out there isn't a bleached craft pulp mill on the planet that doesn't have an effluent pipe coming out of it. If you want white toilet paper, you have to deal with toxic effluent. He believes a new pipe into the Northumberland Strait will pass an environmental review. Trust the science, he says. You're probably used to this, but that's kind of taken my breath away, I gotta say. That's, that's a strong smell. Again, this will all be on site. But is the water gonna be any cleaner at the end of the day? It will be equivalent to what's going out now, which again was, meets the regulations. But here's the rub. The company is asking to keep Boat Harbor open another year so it can get its plan for a pipe in place. In other words, trust us, too. Problem is, trust has been pretty bruised up in Pictou County over the years, according to Ben Anderson. But what if the science says that's not the case, that it's okay to put a pipe in the strait? I'd like to see the science to begin with that they talk about. Because would, you, would you believe it if, if it if I don't said know. That? I honestly don't know, because they said science was good for Boat Harbor. So what kind of science is that? 
and it, it's void of life. So if that's the science we're looking at, I'm pretty skeptical in my own personal opinion. If a pipe was to pass a provincial environmental review, the Premier believes the fishery, forestry and pulp industries could all coexist. But he won't break his word to the Mi'kmaq people by giving the company more time. I, we've given them a five-year window. You're not going to back down on that? Well, we've given them a five-year window. Now, Chief Andrea Paul is upping the ante. It's not just about the pipe or Boat Harbour anymore. It's about the mill itself. I think it needs to close. And I've never said that out loud. Why are you saying that now? Because they haven't done what they should have been doing. And I believe that the mill, they've been able to do what they've always wanted to do. And I think enough is enough. And so for now, there it sits. The mill still pouring waste into Boat Harbor, contaminated, discolored. The controversy churns on and a community's future seems no more clear. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Abercrombie, Nova Scotia. Now across the Northumberland Strait in Prince Edward Island, the Premier there has raised concerns about the environmental impact on his province. But yesterday, the Prime Minister chimed in, seeming to rule out a federal assessment. We uh, understand and respect the fact that it's a provincial lead uh, going through the uh, environmental assessments, uh, but the federal government is also looking into uh, ways that it can support, and that is uh, something we take very seriously. Nova Scotia's Environment Minister, Margaret Miller, is supposed to decide by March 29th whether the new effluent treatment plan can be granted conditional approval. Next on The National, they've traded in their dragon boats for bobsleds, the new team inspired by another Olympic long shot. And we figured that if the Jamaicans can do it, why not us in the Philippines? It's bobsled time! First, though, a look at a story you'll see here soon on The National. She fled Saudi Arabia for a new life in Canada. Now, though, the team faces a different threat. Here's Susan Wormiston with a preview. A government hug and red roses for Rahaf Muhammad when the young Saudi woman first arrived in Canada. But from that moment on, vicious attempts to discredit her. A Saudi video, brand new, compares girls who escape to male terrorists. But her critics are not just in Saudi. You think she's lying? I won't believe anything until I see evidence. Fighting back? Canadian activists. There is a pretty wide campaign to shame her because they want to make an example of her because they don't want other girls to copy her, which is exactly what's happening. Rahaf Muhammad's next battle in coming days on The National. Look at the velocity, 60. Wow. Two. No one's been near that 60 mark. Well, these are truly Canadian images. Canada's bobsled team on Calgary's famous sliding track, built for the 88 Winter Olympics. It's been home to Canada's national teams ever since and just recently hosted the Skeleton and Bobsleigh World Cup. Now, some athletes from far away are hoping it will help them make history. Athletes from the Philippines want to be the first Southeast Asian team to slide in the Olympics. As Aaron Collins explains, their quest is inspired by a famously unlikely team on the same track more than 30 years ago. In the sport of bobsleigh, the learning curve is steep. The stakes are high, and the margin for error is very, very small. There's two ways to finish the bobsleigh. The right way is your head on the, at the top, stay, and the wrong way is your head goes down on the ice, yeah. An early lesson for four athletes from the Philippines making a push to get to the 2022 Olympics in Beijing in one piece. I just accept the fact that it's, it's part of the training and just go in the training. It makes us good, so we already finished right. No easy task for a group that's new to the sport of bobsleigh and to winter. Calgary, it's too cold. 
in <laughs> Philippines we have warm weather. Now, originally, these athletes were world champion dragon boat racers from the Philippines Coast Guard. But it's going to be the uh, crew from the Philippine Coast Guard. They traded in their boat for a bobsled to become the first team from Southeast Asia to compete in the sport. And if it feels like you might have seen this movie before, well, you have, sort of. Feel the rhythm. Feel the ride. Get on up. It's bobsled time. Our inspiration for getting into the sport of bobsled really is, uh, was the movie Cool Runnings. And we figured that if the Jamaicans can do it, why not us in the Philippines? Training on the same track the Jamaicans competed on during the 88 Winter Games. But that plan has hit an early snag. An $8 million funding shortfall at Windsport means needed repairs to the aging track may not get done and it may close for good. Bad news for the Filipino bobsledders and Team Canada, which also trains on the track. We hope that the Windsport retains this track and this facility because it would be a tremendous loss of the sport should it close. There is still hope that the money can be found and that the facility, which includes a rare indoor sliding track, can be saved. But for now, the team from the Philippines is working on their starts, focused on following in Jamaica's tracks and competing in the next Olympics. Getting to the 2022 20, Games? Yeah. I think it's a good push, but I think they can do it. They're, they're, uh, they're a dedicated uh, group of guys. They've been out here in this minus 20 whatever weather, so if they can handle that, I think they can handle quite a bit. <laughs> the track is clear. A goal that depends on three more years of training at Windsport. <laughs> Pushing to go faster and finish the right way, one run at a time. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Cool. Up next on The National, a plane full of passengers stranded on the tarmac and the call from the cockpit that saved the day. A captain came over the uh, speaker to let us know what was going on and to tell us that he was going to order us some pizza to the plane on his time. <laughs> the moment is right after the break, but first. In case you missed it, that's some potentially bad news on planet-destroying space rocks. Since 1998, when Hollywood reached peak asteroid, a popular movie theme has been saving the Earth by blasting asteroids with nuclear weapons, which, to be fair, is actually one of our strategies. But a new John Hopkins University study says asteroids may be much harder to destroy than we thought. After examining rock density and fracturing and running complex simulations, researchers found that even powerful direct hits might not be enough. If the asteroids are large enough, their own gravity could hold them together, and they just keep coming until kaboom! The key, they say, is not to blow them up, but to alter their course. We asked Bob McDonald, host of Quirks and Quarks on CBC Radio, for some options on that. Uh, we could do that with a nuclear device, but you de detonate it beside the asteroid instead of on it, so the radiation pressure and the shock wave would just push it a little bit. Uh, we could put rocket engines on the asteroid and have them just push it out. Or we could paint it white, paint one side of it white, so that sunlight shining on it would actually exert a little bit of pressure and nudge it out of the way that way. Painting asteroids? Wow, talk about an economic action plan. I mean, it is an election year. This is CBC News. What makes it news to you? One small step for man. Is it something that tugs at your heart? The Constitution is now home. Or opens your eyes. The Berlin Wall is coming down. If the story matters to you, your community. Fires burning across the province. Or the entire world. We're going to build a wall. You can always turn to us. CBC News, right where you are. family. We need to stick together no matter what life throws at us. We're going to be all right. Well, it was supposed to be a two-hour hop from Toronto to Halifax, but yesterday an Air Canada flight was redirected to Fredericton due to winter storms and passengers ended up spending eight hours on board. What's more, the airline hadn't packed any meals. Now, it seemed like a recipe for disaster until the pilot did something special. He ordered in. And that's our moment. 
the captain kept us informed throughout the whole flight about what the conditions were like in Halifax. That's when we first knew we had kind of a special guy because uh, he took the time to come on out of the uh, cockpit and traveled right down the cabin and talked to each of us individually. We were on an Airbus with uh, over 150 passengers, so they couldn't take us into the terminal right away. And the uh, uh, captain came over the uh, speaker and let us know what was going on and to tell us that he was going to order us some pizza to the plane on his dime. So I took the phone and he, the guy, I asked him, if I can help him, and the guy said, I'm the captain of the airplane, and he said, I wonder if you guys can make 23 pizza as soon as possible. I said, give me an hour, an hour and a half. I said, and it will be me. So everybody had their bite of pizza and felt a little bit better. They were very pleased, and we really felt that we were well looked after by this guy uh, all the way through the flight. So, uh, yeah, there, there was smiles all around, I think. All right, and the captain's name, according to the passenger, was Andrew Pigeon. And now I pray that I get him on every flight I'm on. <laughs> and he tips well, too, because the driver walked away very pleased with his lovely tip. As right. Well. Yeah, well, well, that's great. See, now I feel bad because whenever I'm in the newsroom and I know my colleagues and I are in for a long day, I, I, I bring like a $4 box of 20 Timbits. I, you know, like two, maybe three Timbits per person. I, I don't spend <laughs> hundreds of dollars Better on Better than pizza. me, <laughs> if I don't even do that. <laughs> well, now I have so, inspiration. <laughs> there are so many fantastic parts of the story, the fact that the captain, you know, stepped up and did this, the fact that the pizzeria was willing to accept this and didn't think it was a prank call. But I'm going to say something, and Rosemary worries that I'm going to spoil the moment, but it's this. Shouldn't Air Canada be trying to bring food onto planes in these long delays? Mm. Does it really have to be up to the captain, the whim of the captain to do that? So I, I love what he did, but, uh, you know, maybe the airline can think about feeding their passengers during long waits. Is that okay, Rosemary? Good luck on your next flight! <laughs> 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 that is the National for March 5th. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>